Hello and welcome to my presentation. This talk is all about making algorithmic music, as seen through the lens of a very particular question. How do I get my computer to understand the music that I want to make? I've spent the last seven years writing and making melodic dance music within the programming language Pure Data. With it, I'm able to tell the computer my musical ideas, get the system to generate patterns, and then I can perform the track in real time. With it, I'm able to make entire pieces of music within 20 minutes, and I've already made hundreds of tracks within it. Today, I want to talk about the pattern generator and how I get it all to work. To help explain this system, I'm going to start by comparing music making to cooking. If you think about making a stir fry, you rarely think in terms of computer instructions. You probably think in much more vague terms. For example, I will make a stir fry. I will boil the rice for 20 minutes. I will simmer the vegetables, proteins, and sauce for 10 minutes, and serve. And if we wanted to create more variety, we can choose from a random selection of ingredients. So how do we get all of this to make sense to a computer? First, we need to break everything up. So let's use the concept as the stir fry to define the structure. Let's use the ingredients as a way to define the inputs. The structure and the inputs are the only two things we need to know to work out how to process and output the sound. The benefits of working within this mental framework is that it gives us all the instructions we need. With it, we can figure out what to do, what order to do it all in, where to put everything, and how long to do everything. So let's take this idea and apply it to music. To make a musical pattern, we need to generate two things, timing and pitch. So let's solve the problem of making rhythms first. The first thing we need is a structure to put everything into. For this, I used the concept of the clave, also referred to as the rhythmic key. The purpose of the clave is to divide a bar of musical patterns into segments. The first beat of each segment is used as a landmark for where we might place a rhythmic event. We can choose whether to place a beat or not using a generative operation. And if we do, we send it to an instrument to play. The clave is our structure and gives us a lot of important information. It tells us the order of operations, where everything goes, and how long it goes for. There are a few different types of clave patterns, but it helps to think of them in terms of how simple or complex they are. Dividing the bar evenly will give us a regular pulse. Using only the even divisions of the bar will give us a steady beat, but not quite a pulse. Using a balance of even and odd divisions will create syncopation, and using an unbalanced mix of even and odd will sound complicated and overwhelming. By describing the balance between simple and complex, we can tune how we want the rhythm to sound. So now that we have our structure, we can start defining inputs. First, we have our instruments, the kick, snare, and hi-hat. As an experienced musician, we can make assumptions about what might sound good to us and start building a generative profile based on that. We probably want a kick drum on the first beat. We might want another kick drum near the end of the beat, so we can choose one at random and then lock it in. The snare might sound good anywhere near the middle, so we can choose one of them at random and lock in its position. And we might want to put hi-hats on every single segment. To expand on this, we can add more attributes and musical embellishments and assign them to each of the segments. We might want to add rolls, triplets, or double strokes, or we might increase the note density. And once we finish the pattern, we just send it to the instruments to start making the sounds. So let's recap. We're using the clave as our structure that tells us where we need to put everything, and then we're populating it with inputs that we can describe in simple music theory terms and then we're processing it and sending it to the output. So that's the rhythm problem solved, and we can already create drum patterns with this. But if we wanted to make a melody, we're going to have to expand this control to include pitch as well. So let's do that. The melody is made up of three elements that need to work together. These parts are the melodic contour, which sets the melodic direction, a scale quantizer to put everything into the same key, and a chord progression to shape the melodic path over time. Let's look at all of these individually. The first step is the harmonic contour. This is a continuous line representing how high or low a pitch might be played. And when a rhythmic event is triggered, a note gets sent out to the instrument. We need a way to control the melodic contour so that we can direct it to our musical intention. So there are three things that we need to define. The shape of the line, the elements of repetition, 
and the pitch register. There are approximately three different types of lines that we can create. They can be steady, smooth, or jumpy. So we can use these words to describe what type of line we want to create and generate it to our preference. Next, we can introduce elements of repetition. To do this, we divide the contour at each of the clave landmarks. That way, we can call upon these individual sections later. Then we can create repetition by using the clave landmarks to re-trigger parts of the melodic line. This allows us to control how repetitive we'd like it to be. Then to provide more variety, we can make changes to the pitch register in time with the clave landmarks. This means we can create variations in pitch even when the contour line has a lot of repetition. With all of these parameters combined, we have substantial control over the direction, repetition, and register of the melody. The next step is to put the melodic line through a scale quantizer. A scale quantizer takes our melodic contour and aligns all of the notes with a scale that we've pre-selected. This gets everything playing in the same key. It's also important that we can change scales during a piece of music. So there are three things that we need to figure out. What sort of scales do we want? What kind of scale modulation do we want? And when do we want to modulate the scales? To choose our scales, we need a way to sort them. So I put them into five categories, major and minor, harmonic major and harmonic minor, and symmetrical scales. For each scale, we choose a mode and a key center, and this defines what our root note will be. Then we can count up from the root note to determine what our scale degrees are, which is important information that we will need later. And once we have our scales and its corresponding degrees, we can choose how we want to modulate the scale. There are a few different methods that we can take to do this. We can move around the circle of fifths, we can do simple key changes, we can use modal interchange, moving between minor and major, or we might stick to only minor modes. Once we've selected our desired modulation style, we can move through that list at will, meaning that we can modulate our key in a very intentional way. Then to decide when we want to change between scales, we have three options. We can change mid-pattern, we can change each bar, or we can change after each section. The last part is the chord progression generator. To generate a chord progression, I use the theory of harmonic function as a way to describe what sort of chords I'd like to generate. Harmonic function is based on the theory that we can categorize chord types based on their qualities of tension and resolution. Chords can sound stable, floating, or colorful, and they can also imply a strong sense of direction towards the root note. Using the scale degrees that we determined earlier, we can make an educated guess about what the function of each scale degree is and assign a function based on each of those chords. This allows us to build a chord progression by describing it in vague terms of harmonic function rather than selecting each chord individually. For example, we might choose suspended or color chords, or we might decide to pick any chord that avoids resolution. Once we've generated our chord progression, we can move through it by advancing either mid-pattern or at the end of each bar. Knowing what chord we are in allows us to direct how we want the melody to sound by further restricting the available notes within the scale. For example, if we want to play the intervals of the triad, we can count up the intervals starting from the currently selected chord. When we change chords, we simply move the intervals to correspond with the new chord. And we can always modify what intervals we want to play. For example, we can choose to play a pentatonic scale alongside the selected chord instead of the triad. With all of these tools combined, it becomes easy to assign parameters to suit different instruments. For example, a bass line might feature a steady contour, so we might stick to simple intervals, like the root note or the fifth. To play chords, we might use a different contour pattern and stick to the intervals of the triad or extended chords. And the lead instrument might have a smooth contour and play in either a pentatonic or diatonic intervals. And since everything is working to the same rhythmic base of the clave, and are quantized to the same key with the scale quantizer, and are playing the same chords, everything will stay unified. So let's quickly recap. We're using the clave as our structure so that we know where to put everything. Then we're populating it with inputs that we can describe in simple music theory terms. And then we're sending it to the instruments to make sound. Thus concludes my explanation of how I create musical patterns. 
I hope this breakdown of my working process has given you a vivid mental framework on how to solve these kinds of problems. I'll include some links to more information in the description. Thank you for listening.